All right, welcome everyone. This is SIG Instrumentation Intro and Deep Dive. I'm Frederick, I'm the founder of Polar Signals and I am one of the tech leads uh, for the special interest group for instrumentation in Kubernetes. And today with me, I have David Ashpool, who is also um, a tech lead and he works at Google. Um, he's a tech lead at uh, within SIG Instrumentation as well. Um, we've also got Ilana, who is one of the chairs of SIG Instrumentation. She works at Red Hat. And we've got Han, who also works at Google, who's also the chair. So um, if you don't already know um, special interest groups in Kubernetes, we have several of these. And essentially, there are focus groups for certain areas um, to focus on. And uh, we focus on instrumentation. And we'll talk a little bit more in depth what we actually mean by that. But um, essentially, we take care of all things observability, right? Um, and uh, today, let's. I want to talk about a little bit, uh, like about that definition, and, and a little bit about how we work as a special interest group. Um, then I'm going to walk over a couple of uh, our sub projects. Um, then Elena is going to talk about um, logging and some of our initiatives within logging. Then David is going to talk about tracing, and Han is going to finish up with metrics and then we'll let you know a little bit about how you can contribute where you can find us and some related talks to these topics so essentially um, the way all instrumentation uh, or, or all special interest groups in kubernetes get created is they have a charter they have a specific purpose and uh, this is an, an a literal excerpt from our charter, our SIG instrumentation charter, and our purpose is to cover the best practices for cluster observability across all components and develop relevant components. So effectively, what this means is that, you know, we care about more than just the Kubernetes slash Kubernetes repository, although we care a lot about this, obviously. Um, but we also create additional components that may be um, additionally helpful to understand what's going on in your Kubernetes cluster. But of course, we also care a great deal about the instrumentation related things within the Kubernetes project. And we maintain several libraries within the Kubernetes uh, repository, but also for external use. And then we create additional components that can be really useful, um, maybe that uh, don't necessarily cover every Kubernetes user, but hopefully um, a lot. So just some examples of sub projects that we have are kube state metrics, kube, uh, klog, this is kind of our canonical logging library for the Kubernetes, um, and uh, the metrics are rent more, and I'll talk about talk more about this. And then uh, we often have kind of, we, we split this, split most of our topics into metrics, logs, and tracing. And more generally, and this is kind of how all special interest groups within Kubernetes work is um, we triage um, all instrumentation related um, issues and pull requests through labeling. And this labeling either happens automatically because we're a code owner of a particular piece of code or someone tags us in it because they have identified this as a, an instrumentation related thing after they've you know done a first pass on uh, the issue or pull request. Um, and then we do try to review all changes for metrics. We are ne not necessarily, not for all metrics are we a blocking review, but uh, for some we may be, um, especially um, for our stability gate guidelines. So um, the, the, the more stable a, met a metric becomes um, in terms of stability guarantees, um, the stricter the reviews become as well. Um, and uh, this is, again, a more general pro process within Kubernetes. Whenever we develop um, larger scale things that are more involved, we create these things called Kubernetes enhancement proposals, or um, in the Kubernetes community, typically they're just referred to as KEPs. Um, and uh, of course, we write these for SIG instrumentation as well. And then, as I said, we maintain subprojects. So let's talk about some of these sub projects and potentially something that you could get involved in. Um, I picked these three ones uh, because they're the ones that I'm 
uh, most familiar with and that I think the, the kind of most important ones that we uh, take care of. So kubestate metrics is the one that um, I personally have, other than the Kubernetes repository, um, been involved with the longest um, and probably the most even. Um, and essentially what kubestate metrics is, if you're familiar with the Prometheus ecosystem, it's a, you can think of it as a Prometheus exporter for a Kubernetes cluster. Essentially what we do is we look at the Kubernetes API and anything that could be possibly useful as a metric in Prometheus, we kind of convert to a Prometheus style metric. Um, and so this way we get information about pods, about deployments, about stateful sets, about all of these wonderful things uh, so that we can then um, you know, create um, alerts or uh, dashboards out of uh, to you know, visualize and make useful. Um, and just just a really quick example that I wanted to bring you to to, to this to highlight the usefulness of the of a, this component. This is an actual example of what we have. We have the expected replicas of a deployment, and we have the actual replicas of a deployment. And why this is useful is now we can kind of compare these two numbers and um, we can understand whether a deployment has been rolled out successfully, right? Um, and this is just one of uh, many useful examples uh, that you could use this for. And kubestate metrics um, exposes a lot of metrics and it's highly optimized. Uh, so it's a really awesome component. And if you're interested in, this is also a really great way to get involved. Then the second component that I wanna talk about is the metric server. Um, in um, Kubernetes, we have an abstract um, API of metrics. Um, and essentially, the reason why this was created is so that we could have uh, a common language to talk for autoscaling needs. So that when we use a lot of CPU or a lot of memory, that we can automatically scale our uh, deployments. And kind of as a side effect of that, we got uh, kubectl top for free. And this is essentially kind of similar to the Linux or the Unix command top uh, that you may be familiar with, where you can see the memory and, use, uh, and uh, CPU usage of your processes. And the way that this kind of just works is that uh, metric server uses what's called uh, Kubernetes ag aggregated APIs. So um, whenever there's a call to the Kubernetes uh, API about a metrics server, uh, a metrics API. The Kubernetes API just forwards this to the metrics server and the metrics server essentially asynchronously collects these metrics from Kubernetes nodes and then returns them on requests. And uh, in a way, the uh, Prometheus adapter is actually the exact same thing, except that it doesn't re-implement all of this gathering functionality. It lets Prometheus do all of this and then just acts kind of as a translation layer uh, so that when the Kubernetes API asks for uh, resource metrics, it just um, forwards that to Prometheus, does the API conversions because obviously um, they, they don't necessarily speak the same APIs um, and then uh, returns this. The really cool thing about the Prometheus adapter also is it doesn't only speak the resource metrics API, but it also speaks the custom and external metrics APIs. And this is really cool because now we can not only auto scale based on CPU and memory usage, but we can auto scale on any metric that we have in our Prometheus server. This is a really, really powerful um, tool to have. Um, and we actually just kind of migrated this uh, project. Previously, this was maintained by Solly. Um, uh, Thank you, Solly, for having maintained this uh, project for such a long time. And now, finally, it's been uh, it's now under the umbrella of the uh, SIG instrumentation. I, I believe we just uh, a couple months ago finished this migration. So yeah, these are the kind of three sub projects that I wanted to highlight uh, to you today. And now Elena goes on with logs. Thank you. Thanks, Frederick. So now I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about what SIG instrumentation is working on in the world of logging. So uh, much of our efforts have been dedicated towards transitioning Kubernetes to structured logs. 
Now you may ask, what is a structured log? So I've demonstrated on this slide uh, as an introduction, here is sort of what the before and after looks like. So the before is the first log line, and that was what a log line in the kubelet looked like prior to transitioning to structured logging, uh, as well as including these after views. Now I've included both text and JSON versions of the log because uh, by default, uh, the kubelet will continue to log in text mode, but you can also turn on JSON mode, which then can be ingested by various log aggregation tools and make indexing of these log entries much easier. So, which brings us the benefits of structured logs. Why would we do this? Why would we want to do this? Uh, it makes it much easier to aggregate and correlate logs uh, by presenting them in a fashion where we don't have to parse them all after the fact. They're already in a serializable format, and then various tools can deal with them rather than dealing with just the raw syslog where we might have to use regexes or other things to parse those log entries in order to determine what happened where. So uh, structured logs win. <laughs> so we started out by migrating the kubelet in the 121 release, uh, and you can sort of track our progress in the attached issue. And part of that work was including some static analysis to prevent regressions. So every uh, file that was migrated in the kubelet was marked such that uh, CI will ensure that uh, if you go and add a non-structured log, uh, it won't pass. You have to go and ensure the log entry is structured. Now, in terms of what we're going to be migrating in the future, uh, we didn't migrate uh, any particular component in 122, although migrations continued. Uh, and we're looking at for the upcoming 123 release, uh, which by the time you watch this recording will now be in progress, uh, selecting components for migration. Uh, so that's tracked in the linked issue there. Uh, we're also looking at deprecating some K-log specific flags in Kubernetes components. Uh, now, these flags have been supported since we uh, initially used, I guess, G-log uh, and then later transitioned to K-log. Uh, but these flags kind of came along as we were implementing uh, K-Log with G-Log support. They weren't necessarily intended to be part of Kubernetes. We just happened to get this feature set. And now when we're trying to implement flag parity between uh, text uh, logging and JSON logging, we're finding that it is relatively difficult in order to support this quite large uh, and featureful set of flags, which include all sorts of options for log rotation and the like. So we currently have an enhancement in progress targeted for the 123 release that will deprecate a number of these flags using the standard Kubernetes deprecation process and uh, remove them from Kubernetes components. So not in scope here is removing them from K-Log itself. They'll stay in the library. We just won't support them in Kubernetes anymore. So. Who's working on structured logging? One of the more exciting uh, things that I get to talk about is the creation of our new working group structured logging in order to manage the structured log migration. Uh, so the organizers of the new working group are Merrick for Google and Shuv Sheksha from Apple. And I'm very excited that they've stepped up uh, to lead uh, this effort. Uh, they have a Slack channel, uh, so you can check it out there. They also have a charter in the community repo and they meet bi-weekly on Thursdays at 1500 UTC. So they need your help. I know that as part of the Kubelet migration in 121, we had a lot of new contributors who helped out with that effort. So I'm sure that there will be lots to do uh, in the 123 release and onward. So it's definitely a great place to get involved if you're looking for new things to do in Kubernetes. Uh, log security is the last thing that I wanted to talk about in the world of logging. So we have a couple of caps on our backlog uh, that we've been working on uh, since the 120 release where we introduced some features to uh, hide credentials and secrets from logs so that you know an attacker, if they're able to access logs, don't get access to the rest of your system. Uh, so we had two of these where we both uh, included static checks at build time to ensure that people weren't necessarily uh, writing secrets out to logs, uh, as well as some support for dynamic sanitization. Uh, so those static checks uh, uh, and dynamic sanitization both debuted as alpha features in the 120 release, uh, which we discussed at KubeCon of last year. Uh, now uh, those static checks are going to be targeted for graduation in uh, the 123 release. Uh, and dynamic sanitization has stayed in alpha for some time, but I believe we will be targeting beta for the 123 release. Uh, and you can enable that feature with the logging sanitization flag. 
And I think that's all for me. And I'm going to hand it over to David to talk about tracing. Thanks, Elena. A lot has happened since the last KubeCon in the area of distributed tracing. My name is David Ashpole, and I've had the privilege of working in this area, and I'm excited to share the progress we've made. Control plane tracing, which includes both the API server and etcd, is now in alpha. This is something that the SIG has been working towards for a very long time, and it's really exciting to finally see it happen. A special shout out to Lily for her work on the etcd integration. Control plane tracing allows cluster operators to collect distributed traces for requests sent to the Kubernetes control plane. This will make it easier to debug slow requests and to figure out what path the request took through the system. Just getting off the ground is an effort to start collecting distributed traces for what the kubelet and container runtime are doing for pods. There's a proposal in the works for how this will work in the kubelet and interest in the integration from some of the container runtimes as well. Finally, there's been a long-term effort to figure out how to propagate context between controllers um, so that we can glue together all of this work that we've been doing. Um, but the context propagation proposal is more general than that and would apply both to traces and to logs. I want to dive a little bit deeper into control plane tracing since it just reached alpha. Uh, so what I did for this demo is I enabled the API server tracing feature gate. And on the API server, I set the tracing config file flag to a file containing the following configuration uh, that sets a 1% sampling rate for the API server. And then on etcd, I enabled the experimental distributed tracing feature. Uh, and for each of those, I ran an open telemetry collector as a sidecar to collect, trace, to collect spans uh, from them and to send them to my backend. In this example, um, I ended up sending them to Jaeger, but it's super easy to send them to hosted uh, trace backends or to other popular open source backends as well. Um, so here's an example trace. Uh, you can see the top bar is the incoming request. So the request first hit the API server at the very beginning. Uh, and then the API server responded at the very end. And so we can see the teal lines uh, are coming, are spans that are emitted by the API server. So that includes this top one and both of these child spans here. Um, and then I'm also running a custom mutating admission controller here. Uh, and etcd has its tracing enabled as well. And that span is here. So from this example, we could see all the way from when the API server first got the request to when it asked for uh, a response from a mutating admission controller um, to when it actually committed the transaction to etcd and responded to the user. So this hopefully will be really useful to operators, as I said. Um, and this is just the beginning. We know that tracing becomes more useful the more things uh, in integrate with it. So uh, we're excited to see where this all leads. Up next to talk about metrics is Han. Take it away. Thanks, David. Hey, everyone. I'm Han, and today I'm going to be talking about metrics in Kubernetes. First, I'm going to talk about some more foundational stuff, and then I'm going to get into the history of Kubernetes instrumentation and how our SIG comes into play. First, you all should know that we use Prometheus clients for instrumentation. This means that the primary Kubernetes components the Kube API server, the controller manager, scheduler, kubelet, all of these things expose text-based metrics endpoints, which can then be scraped and ingested by a various different number of time series backends. Uh, though commonly, this tends to be Prometheus. Prometheus has a number of different metric types, which I won't get into since this isn't a Prometheus talk, but needless to say, we use basically all of them in Kubernetes. Now let's get into some history. Uh, it's a bit of an understatement to say that we've had some problems in Kubernetes with metrics. There is, though, usually a common theme underlying these, which is that metrics can go, grow in size and quickly become memory leaks. This can cause instability in the component. Why is this the case? Let's take a look. Take this example metric. It's a request metric. Like all metrics, it has a width and a height. By width, what I mean is the number of labels. 
for this example metric, we have verb, code, and path. This is a pretty common pattern. So this has a width of three. By height, what I mean is the total number of values that a label can have. So as you can see, the verb has a height of four, code has a height of four, path has a height of one. So every time, like the relationship between labels and label values is that each of these, each of these combinations forms a single time series. Put 200 pods is one time series. Put 201 pods is another time series. Post 200 pods, yet another. So if we add a new label with more than two values, it has a multiplicative effect on the total number of time series. This can be problematic because it, it has a multiplicative effect on, on the size of the metric. So this is where our SIG comes into play. We have exploding metrics, and we need to fix this. So, And we did that. We created a framework which makes the structure of a metric an immutable API. We call this the metric stability framework. With static analysis and hooks in the Kubernetes commit pipelines, we can validate that stable metrics do not structurally change. They will always have the same labels. You will, cannot remove or you cannot add labels of a stable metric. This gives powerful guarantees to Kubernetes users because you know that you can alert off of these stable metrics from release to release without breakage. So you can also create SLOs based off of these metrics. But what happens if there is a code change and all of a sudden a thousand new labels are added to a stable metric? All of a sudden, you're back in the same place. You have an exploding metric, tons of cardinality, and huge memory leaks. If you're a cluster operator, then your fix is basically roll back your cluster to a safe Kubernetes version, wait for upstream Kubernetes to fix this issue, backport it, then cut a release at which point you could have easily been waiting at least a month. Instead, we built this tool, Metrics Cardinality Enforcement. What this allows you to do is at runtime, at runtime, you can specify valid values for a label through a command line flag. That means, let's say, Upstream Kubernetes makes mistakes and releases a bad metric, one that explodes in cardinality because a thousand new labels have been added. You don't have to roll back your cluster. All you have to do is restart it with a flag and bind the possible number of labels for that metric. Then you just wait for upstream to fix it, and then you can roll forwards. And in the future, we want your help. We want to keep improving these things. We want to make the, the usability of instrumentation better for users. Uh, one of the ways that we want to do this is to extend metric stability. We want to bring it into parity with feature stages. Currently, we actually only have two stable classes, alpha and stable. And the former has absolutely no guarantees. And stable metrics have very firm guarantees. We want additional expressiveness to denote metrics which are kind of in the middle and you might be able to set up charts for. We also want to hook into the static analysis pipeline to auto-generate me metric documentation. Currently, the only way to find all of the metrics a component has is either by one, reading the Kubernetes source code, that sucks, or two, curling the metrics endpoint, that also sucks. So please, come to our meetings, get involved. We have a ton of sub-projects that could use your help, like Cube state metrics, metric server, prom queues, structured logging, tracing. Where can you find us? Well, we have a meeting every Thursday at 9.30 Pacific Standard Time, and we alternate each week between a SIG meeting and a triage meeting. Uh, and in the triage meeting, we basically go over issues and PRs relevant for our SIG. You can find us in Slack pretty easy in this SIG instrumentation Slack channel. And you can ping us directly in Slack, and we should be easy to find because our Slack usernames are our GitHub handles. Anyway, thanks for coming and listening to our talk.